It seems that humanity has gone a long way since the first people appeared on Earth. We've invented so much cool stuff and developed new technologies. We've risen above other species after having built an advanced civilization. We've come from living in caves and cooking our food on fire to walking on the moon and creating 3D breakfasts. Does it mean we can be considered a Type 5 civilization? Oh, I see you're confused. Let me tell you about these civilization types and what they mean. The Type 1 title is given to species that have managed to harness all the available energy of their home planet. That's why this civilization is called a planetary civilization. They gather and store this energy to satisfy the demands of a growing population. We would need to boost our current energy production more than 100,000 times to get to this stage. And then we would be able to get control over all natural forces on the planet, like volcanoes, storms, or earthquakes. It's hard to believe, but it's actually a very basic level. You'll see it later. As for now, let's move to a Type 2 civilization. It can use and store energy at the scale of a star system. That's why this type is often called a stellar civilization. Experts have suggested several potential ways to do it. The most popular one is called the Dyson Sphere. This hypothetical device could encompass every single inch of a star, gathering its energy and transferring it to the planet. What would so much energy mean for the Type 2? First of all, nothing we know about could wipe out such a developed civilization. Let's say a moon-sized object entered our solar system and was heading towards Earth. No need to panic. We would be able to vaporize it as soon as we noticed it. Or maybe we'd just move our planet out of harm's way. Now, a Type 3 civilization can control energy at the immense scale of the entire host galaxy. That's the reason it's called a galactic civilization. The inhabitants of such a civilization would probably be totally different from the human race. They could be cyborgs, both biological and robotic beings. Maybe there would be colonies of robots capable of self-replication. They would spread across the galaxy, colonizing star systems. And still, these species would be restrained by the laws of physics, unless they figured out how to travel at the speed of light. At first, the scale describing civilization types didn't go beyond Type 3, but later, it was extended, and that's how Types 4 and 5 appeared. A Type 4 civilization knows how to harness energy at the scale of the universe it lives in. This could probably allow its inhabitants to live inside supermassive black holes. In any case, they would need to tap into energy sources we can't even imagine at the moment, using currently unknown laws of physics. And finally, an incredibly advanced Type 5 civilization might be living somewhere out there. If we reached this level, we would be able to manipulate energy both within our universe and other universes. Of course, at the moment, we're a very long way from achieving a Type 5 civilization, but it's not impossible. Assuming our world remains intact, we might continue advancing with every next generation. Then, a day may come when we'd be able to travel anywhere we want in the multiverse. Maybe we'd even use wormholes, theoretical bridges using space-time that creates shortcuts, reducing travel distance and time. We'd be able to tap into mysterious dark matter to produce energy. And we would find the answers to tons of mysteries about us and the universe. But guess what? At the moment, we're not even a Type 1 civilization. Yep, we're not even on the scale yet. Duh! First of all, we're facing some physical limitations of each type of energy source. Plus, we'd need to balance them not to trigger even more climate changes and not make pollution levels rise. Scientists researching this question have concluded that humanity could potentially reach the level of Type 1. But it wouldn't happen until at least 2,371.
Dozens of spacecraft and hundreds of probes take off from Earth and head for our planet's twin sister, Venus. It's about the same size as the Earth and has around 80% of our planet's mass. The temperatures here are too high for humans, and it doesn't have the air we're used to breathing. But we went there because scientists recently found traces of phosphine gas, which suggests that life might be there. Phosphine comes from various microbes and bacteria, so humanity goes on this journey to discover this life. With our technology, a flight to Venus would take three and a half to six and a half months, but we finally made it. Spaceships are landing on the planet, and when the first humans come to the surface, they see heat-scorched deserts, lava lakes, and geysers of poisonous acid. And that's it. Scientists miscalculated the radio telescope data. Phosphine never existed on Venus. So we're going back to the rockets, and we're getting ready for a longer trip across our galaxy. The scientists believe that there's at least 36 civilizations in the Milky Way that are similar to ours. They could be living organisms completely different from us. They may have different bodies, different eyes. They may walk and talk in a very different way than we do. But an advanced civilization has several criteria, technological progress, and the use of developed communication between individuals. So these civilizations must explore space, build cities, and be able to communicate with each other as independent species. Let's look at our galaxy and find these civilized worlds. So, the Milky Way is a spiral of 100,000 light years from side to side. If a star is born at one end of it in a super powerful blast, the light from that event won't even reach the other end until 100,000 years later. There's about 100 billion stars, and near each of them, there may be worlds similar to our solar system. Let's try to find these habitable worlds using giant sieves. First, we look for stars that have a lot of iron. Such stars burn at the perfect temperature for the development of life and the iron in the star system will help form the cores of planets that will be home to another civilization. We sift the Milky Way through our sieve. We see that there are too many stars that fit the description, so we need another filter. Now let's find stars that look like the sun in this pile. The star must be about 100 times larger than the Earth and 333,000 times heavier. An important criterion is the age of the star. When a star gets old, it begins to expand and turns into a red giant. At this time, it can absorb the planets around it. The life of such a star can end with a huge blast that destroys everything around it. So the star we're looking for must be relatively young. Let's use our sieve again. There's fewer stars, but still that's a lot. Now let's focus on the planets. They should be in the habitable zone of the star. Not too close to a star because then the temperature would be too high for life to be born. And not too far away. Then the planet would just be an ice block with nothing living on it. The temperature of the planet must allow the water to remain liquid. Another filter is the age of the candidate planet. It takes time for an advanced civilization to develop. Based on the experience of Earth, scientists believe that it takes at least 4.5 billion years for any life form to evolve to the human level. So we're looking for planets similar to Earth or older. We use our sieve one last time, and voila, we have 36 worlds where an advanced civilization is possible. Scientists conducted this study and published it in April 2020, based on these very criteria. All that's left is to discover these civilizations and make the first contact. We can detect such a civilization by using radio waves that come from it. Suppose there's a planet A, with primitive living organisms on it, millions of years of evolution, and they'll become a civilization with advanced technology. Radio waves will be the way they communicate. Then the whole planet will emit radio waves like a star emits light. And here on Earth, we'll be able to pick up this signal with antennas pointed into space. But there's a problem with the distance between the planets. For example, planet A is 1,000 light years away from the Earth. When planet A starts emitting radio waves, these signals won't reach us until 10 centuries later. We learned to emit and receive radio waves in 1895. And if the civilization on planet A emitted a radio signal at the same time, we won't be able to pick up that signal until 2895. It'll be the same on planet A. We sent a message in the form of a radio signal into space in 1974. In this signal, we encoded our number system, human DNA, and information about our solar system. If there's an advanced civilization on planet A, they'll be able to receive this signal only in 2974 and we'd have to wait another millennium to get a response from them. Another problem with radio waves is that they don't look like a constant glow on the planet, but like a flare. Radio waves are only used at a certain stage of civilization. 
At first, it's the primary method of communication, but then we begin to use cell phones, cable TV, and fiber optics. And as technology advances further, our radio wave light begins to fade out. So we only have about 100 years of active radio use by civilization to find it. One day, we caught a strange radio signal of an unknown origin. Its characteristics suggested that the signal was created artificially, perhaps by an outer space civilization or a passing starship. Further searches for this signal given no results, and this gave rise to many theories and arguments as to what it really was. It could have been a signal from Earth that reflected off a satellite flying through the sky, or it could have been the traces of a comet a few light years away. But let's assume it was a civilization from outer space, one of those 36 that probably exist. Now we need to make contact with them. So we throw our luggage into a rocket and head out in the direction of our suspected planet. Our rockets can fly at 17,600 miles per hour. That means a rocket could cross the entire United States in just eight minutes. But even if an advanced civilization lived near our closest star, Proxima Centauri, it would take us about 73,000 years to get there. Even at the speed of light, it would take 4.2 years. So we need to solve the problem of space travel. Our scientists plan to reach about a quarter of the speed of light with a laser. A powerful laser beam from Earth will push a microscopic probe in the right direction. This probe could reach our destination in about 17 years. And in another four years, when the signal from it reaches Earth, we'll know if there's an advanced civilization. Another possibility for faster than light travel is the warp bubble spacecraft. The spacecraft would have to compress space in front of it and stretch it behind its tail. Then we'll be able to reach any point in the universe in literally a few seconds. But such travel remains a fantasy for us. Perhaps we can get to different corners of the universe through wormholes. They're shortcuts similar to tunnels, but there's one problem. These wormholes might be inside black holes. They're the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're so heavy that even light can't escape their trap. Our spaceships wouldn't stand the tension either. There's also a theory that Earth is unique because it was born under completely accidental circumstances. Four and a half billion years ago, our planet was a block of lava that began to cool and solidify, but its tranquility was broken by an asteroid the size of an entire planet flying by. The collision occurred at such an angle that the Earth was not completely destroyed, but part of the asteroid remained in our orbit. A heavy rock near our planet stabilized Earth's rotation, and the gravitational interaction with the giant debris caused our core to heat up. In addition, the asteroid brought a lot of water to Earth. Such a collision is extremely unlikely. It's like winning the lottery, many times in a row. But so far, we have no reason to believe life in outer space exists. Just as we have no reason to believe that there's no advanced civilizations in the universe, except for ours. Solar eclipses are cosmic magic tricks, during which the moon suddenly swallows the sun. Only they work not on magic, but on simple science. Let's try to find out how exactly they work and how you personally can observe this fascinating event. It all starts when the Moon, the Sun, and the Earth line up in a straight line, with the Moon positioned directly between us and our favorite star. This alignment is possible because the Moon's orbit around the Sun is slightly tilted relative to the Earth's orbit around the Sun. Solar eclipses only happen during new moons, when the Moon is closest to the Earth in its orbit. So, when the alignment is just right, the moon's shadow is cast on the Earth, blocking the sunlight from reaching us. Imagine being in a room with a giant light switch, but instead of turning the light off, you just cover it with a big old moon. That's basically the solar eclipse. Solar eclipses aren't a regular occurrence, and they only happen a few times each year. The frequency of solar eclipses is determined by many things, like the alignment of the moon, sun, and Earth, and by the position of the Moon in its orbit around the Earth. Now, there are three main types of solar eclipses – total, partial, and annular. A total solar eclipse occurs when the Moon completely covers the Sun's disk and the sky becomes dark as if it were nighttime. This phase can last for a few minutes to just over an hour, depending on the distance between the Moon and the Earth at the time of the eclipse. A total solar eclipse can only be visible from a specific region on the Earth called the Path of Totality. Ooh. This path is typically a narrow strip of land or sea. And if you happen to be exactly in the right spot, you'll be able to enjoy this wonderful view. Unfortunately, not everyone is so lucky to get to see a total solar eclipse. Sometimes the Moon only covers part of the Sun. 
In that case, you'll see a crescent-shaped sun instead of a completely swallowed one. That's called a partial solar eclipse. And if you're really unlucky, the moon might be too far away from the Earth to completely cover the sun. In that case, you'll see a bright ring of sunlight around the moon's silhouette. That's called an annular solar eclipse. Solar eclipses are some of the most spectacular celestial events that we can observe from Earth. People have observed and studied them throughout history, and they've played a significant role in our understanding of the Sun, Moon, and Earth. For example, we use them to measure the size and distance of the Moon and the Sun, to study the solar atmosphere, and to test Einstein's theory of general relativity. Solar eclipses have always been important to people, so it's not surprising that they've always been connected to different myths and superstitions. Some cultures saw them as a sign of dreadful things to come, or a way to talk to their deities. Others thought they could be used to predict the future or scare away evil spirits. All these beliefs show how much solar eclipses have meant to people. There have been many fascinating and memorable solar eclipses throughout history, each with its own unique story or significance. Here are a few examples of some of the most mysterious, cool, or just famous solar eclipses. The eclipse of Thales is one of the most famous solar eclipses in history. It's said to have occurred in the year 585 BCE, and it was reportedly predicted by the ancient Greek philosopher Thales of Miletus. According to legend, Thales was able to predict the eclipse by observing the cycles of the moon, and his prediction is said to have amazed and frightened the people of the time. The eclipse of Ptolemy was a total solar eclipse, that's said to have occurred in the year 150 CE. It's famous because it's mentioned in the writings of the ancient Greek astronomer Ptolemy. He used his observations of the moon's cycles to make his prediction, which astonished and alarmed people of that time. The eclipse of the century was a total solar eclipse that occurred on July 11, 1991. It was visible across a substantial portion of South America. It was the longest total solar eclipse of the 20th century, lasting for more than six and a half minutes. The eclipse of the pyramids was a total solar eclipse that occurred on March 20, 2015, and it was visible from parts of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. It got famous because it passed directly over the ancient pyramids of Giza in Egypt, providing a unique opportunity for scientists and tourists to study the eclipse from this historic location. And, of course, the Great American Eclipse of 2017. It was a total solar eclipse that was visible across a large portion of the United States from coast to coast. It was the first total eclipse visible from the contiguous U.S. in nearly 40 years, and it attracted millions of spectators and was widely covered by the media. Since they happen quite rarely, you wouldn't want to miss such an event. Fortunately, we have a calendar of solar eclipses that will occur in the next few years. The Great North American Eclipse of 2023, expected to be visible in a substantial portion of North America from the Pacific Northwest to the Great Lakes region. It will be the first total eclipse visible from the United States since the Great American Eclipse of 2017. The Eclipse of the Andes of 2024, this one is expected to be visible across parts of South America, including parts of Chile and Argentina. It will be the first total eclipse visible from South America since the eclipse of the century in 1991. The eclipse of the Arctic in 2025. This one will be visible in the Arctic part of our planet, including parts of Canada and Greenland. It will be the first total eclipse visible from the Arctic in nearly 100 years. And the eclipse of the Pacific in 2026. This eclipse will be visible across parts of the Pacific Ocean, including parts of Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. It's worth noting that the exact timing and visibility of these solar eclipses may change as more precise predictions are made. Also, some other solar eclipses may also occur in the coming years. Don't forget to check the details online. But the most important question is, how do we watch them? The answer? Very carefully. Here's some general tips. Use proper eye protection. Never, never look directly at the sun, even during an eclipse. It's not worth risking your sight. To observe a solar eclipse safely, use things like certified solar eclipse glasses or a pinhole projector. 
these devices allow you to view the eclipse without looking directly at the sun, and they help protect your eyes from the harmful effects of the sun's rays. Find a good viewing location. To get the best view of a solar eclipse, it's important to find a location that is within the path of the eclipse and has a clear view of the sky. Use a camera or telescope. If you have a camera or telescope with a solar filter, you can use it to take pictures or observe the eclipse more closely. Just be sure to use a solar filter to protect your eyes and equipment. Stay informed. It's important to be up to date about the details of a solar eclipse, including the exact timing, location, and type of eclipse. This information can help you plan your viewing and ensure that you have the proper equipment and safety precautions in place. That's it. Simple, isn't it? By following these tips, you can enjoy observing solar eclipses safely and responsibly. And if you do get to see a solar eclipse, make sure to snap some pics and share them with your friends. Remember, it's a once-in-a-lifetime experience after all.